how to understand the message. Is there a message from our Creator to human beings? Anyone who believes in the existence of the Creator should answer yes. He should come to the conclusion that there must be a divine message from that Creator to His servants. Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah, all praise is due to Allah. We begin by praising Him. I welcome you all for tonight's lecture by Dr. Jafar Sheikh Idris. Dr. Jafar Sheikh Idris will be talking to you on the topic understanding the message. So I request Dr. Jafar Sheikh Idris to deliver this lecture on the topic understanding the message. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا ما يهدي الله فهو المهتد وما يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا ثم أما بعد I have been asked to talk to you about understanding the message but I thought that before we talk about how to understand the message we talk about the message itself is there a message from our Creator to human beings? Anyone who believes in the existence of the Creator should answer yes. Anyone who believes in the existence of the Creator, irrespective of his religion, and even if he has no religion at all, he should come to the conclusion to the conclusive conclusion that there must be a divine message from that creator to his servants. Why? If a person believes in the creator, he should believe that that creator at least is all-knowing, that he is wise, that he is merciful. He should also believe that it is the, this creator who is providing him with all his bodily needs. It is that creator who created this earth for us, where we find plants, animals, where we find the air to breathe, where we find an atmosphere that um, is suitable for our life, and so on. So he should uh, say to himself, but the creator who provided us with all this, he will not neglect to provide us with what is needed for our spirit. Because that Creator knows that it is in, in virtue of our souls that we are the human beings we are. It is not because of our bodies. There isn't much difference between us and animals as far as bodies are concerned. It is because of our souls that we think, that we judge, that we love, that we have mercy, that we cooperate, and so on. It is because of our souls that we are the human beings that we are. And our Creator knows this. So how come that He should provide us with what is needed for our bodies, but not what is needed for our spirit? Anyone who says that the Creator never sent any message to anyone or that we don't need a message like this is a person who really doesn't know the Creator. That is why we read in the Quran, وَمَا قَدَرُ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ إِذْ قَالُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَى بَشَرٍ مِّنْ شَيْءٍ They had, have not given Allah His due when they said that he never sent any message to anyone. Now, if you come to this conclusion, then you should say to yourself also, if the Creator sends a message, then that message must be accessible to everyone in the world. What is the use of sending a message if it is impossible for people to, to have it, to get access to it? He should also believe 
that there must be conclusive evidence that this message is from the Creator. If there is no evidence, then we'll be in doubt all the time. Like many people now in the world, they have some books which they call sacred, but they are not 100% sure that everything in those books is from the Creator. But they should say to themselves, a Creator would not do something like this. If he sends a message, he will ensure that that message is known to the people to whom it is sent. So they all should also come again to this conclusion that that message must be accessible, that we must be able to identify it and know that it is the message from our Creator. How do we know this? There are many things, many characteristics that we should look for for a message like this. There are many conditions that it must uh, satisfy. And we can do all this just by thinking. Perhaps the first thing that we should do when we start looking for a message like this is to pray to our Creator. Some people in the United States who told me that they were believers in the Creator, but they had no religion and so on, I told them, what contact do you have with this Creator? What do you do? They said nothing. We try to help people and so on. I, I told them that the first thing that you should do is to pray to him. If you are looking for the true religion, turn to him and ask him, Oh my creator, show me you know that I am sincerely looking for guidance from you. So show me where I can find this guidance. So that is the first thing that a sincere believer in the Creator would do. Second, he would say to himself, if this message is from the Creator, then it must be consistent. If there are contradictions in it, then it cannot be from God. God does not contradict himself. It is only human beings who contradict themselves because their knowledge is imperfect or they are forgetful. You start by saying something, and you end up saying something which contradicted what you said at, the, at first. Perhaps because you forgot, or you did, were not aware of the fact that this, what you said at uh, the end of your speech, contradicts what you said at the beginning of your speech. But that does not apply to the Creator. What is interesting about the Quran, the Quran itself tells you how to rationally judge its authenticity. For example, it says, وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا Had this book been from someone other than Allah, they would have found many contradictions in it. So the fact that there are no contradictions in it is one evidence that it is from the Creator. So this is the first thing that you should uh, look for. Secondly, it must be factual. It should not contain any falsehoods about the world. Why? Because the Creator created this world and He knows what He created. He would not create it in one way and then tell us about it in another way. So if there are factual mistakes in uh, what is claimed to be a message from the Creator, then that itself is evidence that it is not from the Creator. The Creator does not utter falsehoods. He knows his world, um, he is wise, he is merciful, he intends to guide us and not to mislead us. Thirdly, that message must satisfy our spiritual needs. That's what we want it for. Just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is providing us, as we said at the beginning, for what is needed for our bodily upkeep. So it must also provide us, that message must provide us with what we need for our souls. 
Now the first thing that we need is to know more about this creator. We know he created us in such a way that we know something about him, even without any help from anyone. Just as human beings, once our minds develop, we come to the conclusion that there is a creator, that he is all-knowing, that he is powerful, and so on. We know just by what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put in our hearts as human beings that he must have these attributes and qualities. But we need more. And we cannot know more about him if he does not help us. Yes, we can know much about him from his creation. But that is not enough. We want to know more about him. So that message must contain good knowledge for us about the Creator. And secondly, we want to have relationship with that Creator. So the message must tell us how to establish a relationship like this, how to worship Him, how to contact Him. And this is the meaning of prayer, and I mean Salah in, in the Arabic language. So Salah is the most important way of having relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Salah has a broader, broader meaning than just the five uh, prayers of ruku and sujood. Dua, just like in English, it's called prayer. It is also in Arabic, Salah, and so on. Everything that brings you nearer to your creator is uh, Salah. Also, we need to know how to lead a life of which he approves. How we can lead a life which makes us happy as human beings. There are many things that we need and we can't have knowledge of without help from the Creator. That is why people who don't follow any guidance from the Creator differ so much on even uh, some of the basic things. So we need guidance from Him. How, what to do with our wealth, what kind of relationship should we have with other human beings, what kind of relationship should uh, the sexes have with each other, what are the principles on which our political system should be based, and so on. We need all this. So the message from the Creator must be a comprehensive one. Now, if you come to this conclusion, then you start looking for that message. And you will find uh, many people telling you that this message is from God. Other one says this message from God. This one says this message from God. But you have already come to the conclusion that Allah, the Creator, would not do a thing like this. He would not do a thing like this. He would not leave his servants um, perplexed, not knowing which message uh, is the true message. He would not send more than one message that are contradictory. One message says, Allah has no children. Another says, no, he has children. These are inconsistent. So one must be right, the other must be wrong. So you come to the conclusion that there must be only one true, authentic message, and you look for that uh, message. This is about the importance of having message. Now, having found the message that I want, now I want to know how to approach this message. Or even before, even before I believe that it is the message. If someone, if I am not a Muslim, and someone tells me, a Muslim tells me, that this book called the Quran is the message from God. And I want to know what that message contains. What do I do? I ask, what is the original language of this message? They say, the message itself says, it is Arab. So I say to myself, perhaps the best thing is to study the language of this message. Yet I can know much about it from translations. But I want to be sure. I want to have first knowledge of this message. So I go and study the Arabic language. 
Now, I say to myself, this book is in Arabic. Therefore, the first thing that, the first condition in understanding it would be to interpret its verses, its words and expressions according to the rules of the Arabic language. This is what anyone would do with any book. If uh, you want to study Greek philosophy, as it was written by the Greeks themselves, and you go and study old Greek, and then uh, study the texts of those um, philosophers, you would give their words the meanings that they were intended to have at that time, not in modern Greek. The same thing with Arabic language. If an Arabic word acquires a meaning after the Quran is, is sent, no, that meaning is not what is meant when the Quran was sent. So I give the words and expressions of the Quran the meanings that they have in that language. Moreover, I must give them the meaning that they have in the context. And this is what I do with all books. Whenever I read a book, even books written by human beings, I don't give every word any of the meanings that the dictionary says that it has. No, I give it the meaning that is implied by the context in which the sentence is mentioned. So this shows you that uh, when some people say the message must be reinterpreted, the Quran or the Bible or uh, Old Testament or so, some people say the message must be reinterpreted to suit our times. But a person who says this is deceiving himself. This means that he reads the message, he understands what the verses say, he doesn't like what he understood, and therefore he goes and reinterprets the statement, and to reinterpret it, you have to distort the meaning. And so instead, if he was honest, he would say to himself, this is what the Quran says, I don't like it, so I'm not a Muslim. But what he is doing would be something worse. He would say, I don't like it, but I would like to make God say what I want him to say. And this is worse than just denying what uh, the Creator said. Secondly, after language comes other verses of the Quran. And here that applies even to people who don't uh, read the Arabic language. If you are reading a translation of the Quran, and it is better to read more than one translation in your language, or if you know more than one language, then read it in different languages because uh, no translation of the Quran is perfect. What you lack here, you find there, and so on. So, second uh, condition for understanding uh, the Quran is to understand the verses of the Quran in the light of each other. Don't interpret any verse of the Quran in a way that makes it contradict another verse. Because you know that since this Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it is consistent, then no verse in it should be made to contradict another verse in the Quran. Not only this, because as everyone who has uh, knowledge of the Quran, everyone who has not that knowledge knows, the Quran itself explains, the Quran explains itself. It, sounds, it says something briefly in one verse, it elaborates on that in another verse, or in more than one, one verse. For example, you read every time you pray, إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Guide us to the right path. What is that right path? You find many verses in the Quran which show you what that right path is. Sirata al-ladheena an'amta alayhim. The path of those on whom you bestowed your uh, blessings. Who are they? You find this in other verses of the Quran. Ghayrin maghdubi alayhim. Walad dalleen. 
Who are these? You find answers in the Quran. Now, one before the last is the Sunnah of the Prophet Allah Subhanahu wa Taala sent the Quran to the Prophet, and he asked him to convey that message to us. Now, some people think of the Prophet as just like a postman. That is not the role of the Prophet. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Wa anzalna ilayka zikra li tubayyina lil nasi ma nuzila ilayhi." You do not just convey it to them. But you explain it to them. You explain it by word of mouth and by your deeds. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنٌ You have good example in that of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So if you want to worship Allah, if you want to understand the Quran, see what the Prophet says and what he does. So a person who says, I believe in the Quran, but I don't believe in the Sunnah. He is not saying La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, because to be a Muslim you say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So if you claim that you don't need the Sunnah of the Prophet, then why do you say Muhammad Rasulullah? Why do you say Muhammad Rasulullah? Someone might say, Yes, I believe that he just conveyed this message to me. That's why I said Muhammad Rasulullah. But we say. The message itself tells you that there is more to the Prophet than this. There are more than 40 verses in the Quran which tell us about obeying or having good example in the Prophet So you are neglecting all this and yet claiming that you follow the Quran. Someone might say, no, I don't deny the Sunnah of the Prophet. But I'm not sure that all these ahadith, what the Prophet said, I know I have confidence in the Quran because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafizun. Allah ensured that he will preserve the Quran. But if you look carefully into the verse, you will come to the conclusion that he also, that that verse itself means that he preserves the Sunnah also. Because in that verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say, we'll preserve the Quran. He said the zikr. You know the word zikr? Zikr is something that reminds you, that will have an effect on you. And it cannot be zikr if it is not understood. So Allah does not preserve the Quran just as a text that can be put in any museum. He preserves the Quran as a zikr, as something that guides people. And for it to guide, it must be understood. I found it very interesting when I realized that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he talked about the Prophet being entrusted with explaining the Quran, again he said the zikr. وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الزِّكْرَ so if we need, if people at the time of the Prophet ﷺ needed his sunnah to understand the Qur'an, it goes without saying that we, all need, we also need this. If the Prophet is the last of the Prophets and his message is universal, then that message must also be preserved. So preserving the Qur'an also means preserving the Sunnah of the Prophet In fact, it also means preserving the language of the Quran, because if no one understands Arabic language, then the Quran will not be understood as a thicker. Even more than this, the Prophet tells us that this, this religion will be preserved in the form of human beings. There will be people who understand this religion and who believe in it. So anyone who says that he believes in the Quran, but who doesn't believe in the Sunnah, or he doesn't believe that the Sunnah is preserved, is in fact contradicting himself. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us to see the truth and to distinguish from truth and falsehood and give us good knowledge of his uh, message 
and give us and help us to apply that message in our life. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair, brother. Uh, please stick to the topic. If there are non-Muslims, please give preference to them. Yes, brother. My question is, in college, we used to discuss regarding Islamic teaching with our non-Muslim friends. But some among them say, though Bible and Quran, both the revelations of Allah, but we Muslims say, whatever in Quran has no contradiction, but Bible has some contradiction. So they say, how Bible could be the revelation of God? So please explain about it. We don't only claim that there is no contradiction because it is from God. We say go and study it and see whether there is contradiction or not. But about the Bible, it is not we who, only we who say that there are contradictions. The scholars, Christian scholars of the Bible say that there, there are contradictions in it. Because they don't believe that the Bible as we have it now it is not like the Quran. This is not a translation of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to Isa. This is what uh, people after Isa, so many years after, this is what they understood. And each one wrote his own, that's why they say uh, the gospel according to so and so. And these are ordinary human beings. They are not prophets. And the Quran tells us, had this book been from other than Allah, they would have found many contradictions in it. And because these books are written by human beings, we find contradictions in them. We find contradictions in what Muslims write. If a Muslim writes a book 200 pages or so, and even if he's a sincere Muslim, a good Muslim, that doesn't mean he doesn't commit uh, mistakes or he doesn't uh, contradict himself. So what we are saying about the Bible is not what we say. It is what the Christian and Jewish scholars of the Bible say about the Bible. They even say that there are scientific falsehoods in it. It's not we who say it, they say this. So if you want to convince them, perhaps you can read what uh, their own people say about uh, the, the Bible, give them some of the, of the books, or you can point to contradictions. Tell them that the Bible says this here, it says that here, and these are uh, contradictions. So I repeat, it is not just we are making a claim. We are not saying just because this is the word of God, there is no contradictions in it. In fact, we are saying the other way around. Because there are no contradictions in it, it must be the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My name is Rame Gowda. God is aware of it, even 9th September matter also. If so, God is aware of it, what is happening in Iraq today. They were telling so many weapons are there, this are there, that are finally they didn't get anything. Still, they bombarded Iraq. Is it in order? Is Allah is looking after calmly? And how long? People are suffering. Even today, bombs are bursting, and God is seeing simply. What is the answer for this? Did the brother mean that Allah should not allow anyone to do any evil thing? Every time you want to do some evil, Allah stops you. <laughs> then, if that were the case, Allah wouldn't have sent prophets. Why send prophets? Because prophets are sent to tell people, this is good, do it. This is bad, don't do it. Because, but if Allah is not going to allow anyone to do any evil, then there is no point in sending prophets. In fact, there is no point in even having knowledge. I don't have to know what is evil, what is good, because I am sure that every time I want to do something evil, Allah <laughs> will stop me from doing it. There would be no need for life after death. No need for hell and paradise because you do something good and this is a reward for what you are doing. But if you are made in such a way that you cannot do any evil, then there is no need for rewarding you. If you are made in such a way that you cannot do any evil, there is no point in having punishment because punishment is only for people who intentionally and willingly do something. So if you ask a question like this, it is as if you are asking, 
Why did Allah create us the way he created us? He should have created us in another way. That we don't have intentions, we don't have will, we don't learn, we don't know the difference between good and evil, and we don't have the power to do any evil, and so on. So I don't understand the point of the Quran. Another point that I don't understand is, why are people always making a big fuss about September 11? Is this the worst thing that human being did in the history of the world? Is it? These people, yes, they did something wrong. They killed uh, about 3,000 persons. But then the United States, according to one professor I know of, a uh, professor in Chicago, he was counting the number of people killed in Afghanistan, as they say, uh, collateral, innocent people killed. He was counting the number. And he said that exceeded 3,000 innocent people killed in Afghanistan. Why? When someone kills Afghanis, it is okay. But if uh, the Americans are killed, then there's big fuss in the world. How many Iraqis are killed in Iraq? The, some British people now are asking their prime minister to tell them. They want to know how many people were killed in Iraq. But people also, you, and I, in my country, and many other people, were colonized by these people. They came here, took over your country, I mean, but people don't talk about this. But because the Americans are powerful, they are important people, then everyone is saying, why should 3,000 Americans, or because perhaps they have the media, if something happens to them, then everyone in the world knows, but um, if some people die in my country, to hell they go. No one knows about them. So the, when the brother said, no one is doing anything against America, this is not true. Many people are doing what they can. The Prophet Sallallahu said, if you see munkar, and yani something bad that is done, then try to change it. If you can change it with your hand, I mean, if you have the power to change it, then do that. Now it seems, that no one has the power to force the United States to do something or not to do it. Then comes protest with the tongue. And many people in the world are doing this, alhamdulillah, even inside the United States and inside Britain. Non-Muslims, British nationals, American nationals, they are saying that uh, what is done is good. So it is not true that no one is objecting to what the Americans are doing. Also, the general advice to brothers and sisters, don't take your religion from everyone. Because the, the Prophet ﷺ said that there will come a time when there will be divisions among Muslims. There will be confusion. And uh, when the companions asked him, what should they do in that case? He said, follow my way and the way of my companions. Alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnah of the Khalifa who come after him. Ma alayhi ana wa ashabi in another version. Follow what I and my companions do. And unfortunately, there are very few people in the Muslim world who are doing this. If all these Muslims were good Muslims and were following the true teachings of the Prophet, our condition wouldn't have been what it is now. Because our condition is very sad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised that he will never give the non-Muslims, the kafirs, upper hand on uh, the Muslims. But he said al-mu'mineen. This man the people who are truly faithful, who uh, satisfy the conditions of Iman. He didn't say, I will do this to everyone who calls himself a mu'min, who calls himself a Muslim. So if you increase the number of Muslims who are real Muslims, who follow only the Qur'an and the Sunnah, the way of the Prophet, the way of the companions, you will be doing your Ummah a great service. And don't be disencouraged by the great number of people who have gone astray. Because even if there are good number of good Muslims who follow the, the Qur'an and the Sunnah and the way of the 
companions of the Prophet, the things, inshallah, will change. Dr. Jafar, everybody here. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alaikum assalamu warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Sayyid Altafur Rahman Adil. Dr. Jafar, uh, I would like to ask you with regard to Sunnah, the Hadith. You see, it is uh, so many times a topic of discussion after dinner amongst the Muslim intelligentsia that since Quran itself is a complete book, is a way of life by itself, why do we need Sunnah? My point is that while Quran, God, Allah has undertaken to protect Quran, so we have no problem accepting every word in the Quran. But as far as Sunnah, the Hadith and the sayings of the Prophet are concerned, how do we know which Hadith is authentic? So I would like to know from you, uh, Dr. Jafar, as to what you, ha you have to say about Sunnah and the Hadith. Thank you. I believe that if you read the Quran carefully and you believe that is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you should come to the conclusion that the sunnah must be preserved, even before you know how it was preserved. So I, I said this in my speech. If you know, you read in the Quran, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised to preserve the Quran as zikr, not just as a text, meaning as something that can be understood and can affect people's lives. This is the first premise. Second, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa We sent down that zikr to you so that you can explain to the people what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down for them. So this means that that zikr cannot be fully understood without the bayan, the explanation of the Prophet So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not say that the Quran cannot be explained without the sunnah of my Prophet and then preserve the sunnah and preserve the Quran and cause the sunnah to be lost. No, not even a wise um, human author like you would do this. You don't write a book and say in that book, that this book cannot be under, fully understood without the accompanying notes. And then you publish the book without the notes. Th that doesn't make sense. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not do a, a thing like this. So even before you study how the sunnah was preserved, you must have this faith. This comes as a result of your belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and your belief in the sunnah of the Prophet Then you go and study. The Sunnah was preserved in the most scientific way. I mean, no statements of any human being other than the Prophet ﷺ have been preserved the way the statements of the Prophet ﷺ were preserved. Sometimes people think that it would have been better, say, if the words of the Prophet were written down. And we have a book, say this book was written, at the time of the Prophet. So, that is not enough. We want to know who wrote the book. Is this the same handwriting of the person who wrote the book? Who said that? Some people say it would have been better if it was, was recorded. Accord, again, that is not enough. That we don't know what is the voice of the Prophet ﷺ. Many people had voices almost like that of the Prophet ﷺ. We don't. So, what is the best way to preserve or to have a scientific way of ensuring that this is what the Prophet said. Two ways, I mean two conditions. And this, this is the gist of the whole edifice of the science of the Hadith. That this Hadith is reported by someone, companion of the Prophet. Now, we require two things. Anyone who says that he heard this from someone, then the person must be Adl means truthful, and he must have a good memory. So if Al-Bukhari says that he heard this from his sheikh, now we go and study who Al-Bukhari is. Is he a truthful person or not? Now, who is his sheikh? 
Is he a truthful person? Did he have good memory? Who is the sheikh of the sheikh? Until we come to the companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is called Islam. Now, if all the, the people in this chain satisfy these conditions, then we say the hadith is sahih. Now, if one of the people is known to have bad memory, then we can't depend on them. We say hadith is ta'if. If one of them is not known to us, it might be that he was known to the person who heard from him. But we didn't find any information about him. We say that hadith is ta'if. If the person is known to be a liar, then his hadith is completely rejected. If the hadith contradicts another hadith, um, which we know to be sound, then we give preference to the one that has the strongest evidence behind it. So the fact that there are false ahadith or weak ahadith doesn't mean that all the ahadith are, are, are not sound or that there is no way. In fact, the fact that there are weak ahadith shows that there was, there was a science according to which people could judge, the scholars could judge that this hadith is sound, that hadith is, is not sound. If there were no such a science, we wouldn't have been able to distinguish between what, what, what is hadith and not. Huh? If we reject a particular hadith which doesn't make sense, so where, where do we stand then? No. I mean, it, it, it depends on what you mean by it doesn't make sense. If there is a contradiction in it, yes. it doesn't make sense. Then we say that the Prophet couldn't have said this. If, so, but there is a difference between not making sense and not accepted by your opinion, or not usual. Because if you say this, then you should reject some verses in the Quran. You read in the Quran about a bird, or about an ant, that said to the other ants, Ya ayyuhannam, lutkhulu masakinam. Oh ants, get into your home. If this were a hadith, some people would have said, this must be a weak hadith or false hadith. How can an ant talk? And a bird, Suleiman, according to the Quran, used to understand the language of birds. We cannot imagine this. How can a bird talk and be understood? And how can it know even the true Tawheed? There is a difference between rejecting something because it is not familiar to you or your opinion doesn't accept it and that it is irrational or inconsistent. There is a difference between the two. When the Prophet ﷺ made the journey to Jerusalem from Mecca, what was the main reason for people who rejected it? Because this was not something with which they were familiar. How can a person go from Mecca to Jerusalem and come back same night? Impossible. It is not impossible. But it is not something that is with which people are familiar. If someone 100 years ago said that someone can go to the moon and come back, someone would say this is impossible. It is not impossible, but it is not something with which uh, people were familiar at that, uh, at that time. Jazakallah Hayran. We close this session with the dua of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is the Sunnah. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika wa shahadan la ilaha illa anta wa astaghfiruka wa atubi ilayka.